thanks everybody for coming tonight. And before I read, um, well, actually I'm going to read Rick's bio. And then after that, he's going to read an excerpt from the book, but I'm going to have him read his elevator pitch because he has an awesome elevator pitch. So um, I'm going to read his bio here. A native of Flint, Michigan, Richard Meredith moved to California while serving in the US Navy. After obtaining undergraduate and graduate degrees in biology, he worked as a marine scientist and wildlife biologist for the federal government and the private sector. His first novel, Sky Dance, was based on his environmental work in the oil fields of Ecuador. His crime thriller, The Crow's Nest, won the Silver Falchion Award for the best action adventure novel at the 2021 Killer Nashville Mystery and Thriller Writers Conference. It draws heavily on his work aboard commercial tuna saners, did I say that right, Rick? There you go. <laughs> and marine research vessels in the Pacific Ocean. When not writing and reading, he enjoys travel, bird and wildlife watching, scuba diving, guitars, rock concerts, and most sports. He is a board member of Capital Crimes, the Sacramento chapter of Sisters in Crime. Rick is married with two children and four grandchildren. So Rick, before you read the excerpt, um, as I said, I'd like you to read your elevator pitch. Well, that was uh, submerged in a crude submarine hundreds of miles off the shore with a crafty smuggler and 10 tons of cocaine stolen from a ruthless drug lord. Chase Brenner's having second thoughts about Johnny's plan, but it better work or his family is toast. <laughs> so if that doesn't make you wanna read it, I don't know what will. That's a very good example of an elevator pitch. So Rick, when you're ready. So I'll just read chapter one. It's okay. I'm a, I hope I'm a better writer than reader, but we'll find out. Chapter one, Eastern Tropical Pacific off Baja, Mexico. The sea can keep a secret and the night can hide its sins. It's your friends you gotta worry about. Isosceles LeBeau, Captain Johnny to all but his mama, wedged his short, reedy frame through the top hatch of the crude submarine. Steadying himself against the slow swell lapping three feet below, he scanned the darkness. A stingy moon is only light. It was almost serene but he knew tranquility at sea was an illusion. Like his ex-wife, it could turn fast. He pawed the scruff of his six-day beard, more out of anxiety than discomfort, before checking his watch. He was early, which should have brought him some satisfaction after a grueling trip from Columbia and navigating blind under the sea half the time. But the sooner he unloaded, the faster he'd get to land in a few days of real sleep before starting again. It was time. Get ready below, I'm gonna set signal. After a few moments, Johnny heard his two crewmen scramble to their stations at the port and starboard cargo hatches. Johnny raised a light and sent the signal. Praying under his breath, it caught the right eyes. Lashed together, less than a mile away, three speedboats drifted in an empty sea. The six men aboard were silent, their hearing dulled by the screeching outboard motors after the two hour run from Ensenada. They were, however, vigilant straining tired eyes in the blackness for the signal that would get them home again. Falco, the leader of the small armada, peered again at the GPS screen and looked up. Hopeful expectation was etched in the faces of the men. He folded his arm and shook his head, nada. Disquiet settled over the boats. Falco knew these men, to these men the sea held no allegiance, no allure. It was a job, a dirty job, and if not for the threat of a double tap through the brain, they'd be chugging cheap tequila at some skanky beach bar and not hear puking their guts overboard. The spell broke. 10 o'clock, the crewman from Bravo boat shouted, pointing southeast, lights, 1,500 meters. Four long flashes, a pause, two short flashes. That's it, ready up. Falco reached under the console and grabbed a spotlight. Two quick signals, four long. Two long flashes returned. The speedboats roared to life, strafing the Pacific on cushions of royal foam and throttling down just 50 feet short of the beacon. The boats idled like jittery thoroughbreds in, in the starting gate, gasping, gurgling, and coughing acrid fumes into the still sea air. Falco squinted hard. The target was barely visible. Only three foot shone above the surface. 
her gray blue skin, the color of her namesake, the whale. A low rumble reverberated through the hulls of the speedboats as hissing air from the whale's ballast tanks erupted in a torrent of bubbles. In slow motion, a shadow arose from the black depths. A dim light appeared as her starboard hatch opened. Falco gestured to the other drivers. Bravo boat motored over and the crewman jumped aboard. Charlie boat followed, disappearing around the whale's stern before tethering to the port hatch. At a distance, Falco watched as four men, two from the speedboats, two from the whale, struggled to offload the 200 pound bales. Within 15 minutes, the two burdened speedboats slogged for shore. Falco motored Alpha boat into position. At the hatch, he locked his eyes on his crewman. You know what to do. The man's face was erased of expression, pulled, patted at the bulge in his waist. Johnny was in the bilge when the deafening report of the handgun echoed through the cavernous hull. Startled, he hoisted himself from the bowels of the whale to see his two crewmen lying dead on the deck. Johnny glared at the shooter, his revulsion masked beneath a thousand yard stare, the face of wounded detachment. The shooter shrugged, shoved the revolver back into his waistband and smirked. No witnesses, no evidence. Johnny stepped over the bodies of his crewmen and boarded Alpha Boat. In only a t-shirt and shorts, the fresh sea air chilled him. The pilot offered his hand. I'm Falco, good job with the shipment. Johnny nodded and moved toward the bow. Alpha Boat chugged away from the submarine for several feet before Falco juiced her to life. Johnny sat alone, his attention drawn to his watch as he wiped the salt spray from his black hatchet-shaped face, a testament to his Haitian, Choctaw heritage. He looked up and caught Falco's gaze for a moment, then down at his watch and a silent count. A blinding yellow-orange flash seared the night. Seconds later, a 30-foot plume of water and debris erupted, followed by a thunderous roar. The men braced against the gunnels as the violent surge pummeled the boat and the salt spray rained. Jesus H. Christ, Falco yelled. They're going to see that explosion for miles. He jammed the throttle forward and the bow of the 25-foot-long boat lurched upward five feet as the blades of the twin props grabbed the sea. Only when they were safe from the wreckage did he turn to Johnny and ask, what the hell happened? We lose this ship, or this load, we're both dead. Johnny, a drenched cigarette dangling from his lips, shot him a dismissive glare and in little more than a murmur finally said, no witnesses, no evidence. And that's the end of chapter one. Very dramatic. So my first question is, you obviously have a lot of experience on boats. And can you talk a little bit about that and tell us about any danger you were ever in or, you know, anything scary that kind of helped you create this scene? Well, it's one of the ironies of my experience on those tuna boats. It was my first job out of college. I got a job with the National Marine Fishery Service in San Diego, and we were monitoring the, the dolphin mortality from the, from the fishing activities. And when I went into the interview for the job, the, uh, the guy from the National Marine Fishery Service saw that I was, I had been in the Navy. He goes, oh, I didn't let him know that I never saw a ship my entire time in the Navy. This is my first time at sea when I got on the tuna boat, but it worked out okay. But no, there were, it was never, uh, one thing about the, the fishing boats is that they try to avoid bad weather because they can't fish or they can't work when it's bad weather. So they're always running from the storms. But there were a couple of times and, you know, we were out there for 60, 90 days at a time without going to shore. So wow. it was, uh, it was long and, and boring a lot of times, but first trip, I took a lot of, a lot of, you know, mind candy books with me. The second time I took some heavier reading. So I had something to do because there were no VCRs back in those days and no satellite um, transmissions, but it was, uh, it was very interesting. I learned a lot. Well, in the crow's nest, the scenes are very realistic. And I'm wondering, have you ever traveled to Mexico and experienced anything like drug trafficking or anything related to the events that you describe in the story? No, that was all internet. That was Google. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, got that from a lot of different books, a lot of different sources. But the, the whole thing about the, uh, the narco submarines was, you know, there was actually, I saw a documentary on it. I thought, oh my oh. God, can you imagine what it'd be like in one of those things going, you know, 2000 mile route, 30 feet under the sea, you know, having to hold your breath literally for like half the day because you, you 
you had to be underwater during the day because they could spot you. And at night you'd come and surface and let, let the diesels recharge the batteries. And there's no toilets, everything's in a bucket, it goes overboard, you know, and it's gotta be a miserable place, no ventilation. So wow. that's, I thought somehow I've got to combine that with the tuna boat. So I, I figured out a way to do it. Yeah, good job. Um, and I'm curious about the cartel boss, Fernando Cuervo. How did you come up with his estate? Well, you know, he, I like to have my, my bad guy has got, you know, they've got, he's got to have a duality of, of, of you know, he was actually started out as a pretty great guy, but then uh, he got, he got sideways with one cartel who killed his brother and he was seeking revenge. So he became the head of another cartel just as, as a revenge motive. But here he is, he's got a, to every to outside appearance, he's, he's a normal guy. You know, he's got a family and he's, he's a respected the businessman. And one of his side businesses is running this, this tuna fleet that he uses as a cover for, you know, laundering money and also rescuing packages that are lost at sea. But uh, so he, there's a, there's a, there's some good to him, but uh, he, he did make a wrong turn. And by the same token, Chase, the, you know, the protagonist, you know, he, he's pretty much a milk toast guy most of the time, but he suffers from this uh, dissociative rage every once in a while. And he just goes off the deep end. So I've got, I had to have a little balance between the good and the bad with both of those, both those characters. And Johnny is just, you know, he's just another guy altogether. <laughs> a loose cannon. Yeah. Um. So when you describe, I just want to ask one more time about the estate where Fernando lives, because it's just really opulent, you know, like, did you ever go visit something like that? Or, or did you just make it all up? That was pretty much all made up. I was trying to think, how would you, you know, how would you bulletproof a hacienda, you know, and how would you make it, you know, resistant to the, the, your, all your rivals and other cartels, you know, to keep your, your wife and son safe. And uh, so and then having all the houses in the subdivision occupied by other cartel members that are your bodyguards. So that was, it was mostly my imagination. No, I've never been to a cartel house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you do have a pretty good imagination, I must say. Um, so you were a biologist on a commercial tuna fishing boat and so what did you learn about that in terms of the dolphin thing? Can you just touch on that? I mean, we're not here to talk about that, but it's kind of interesting. It was, uh, yeah, I, I was on two boats. The first boat was, uh, was uh, I, I met down in Panama, and then we, we fished the Eastern Tropical Pacific, and it had a pretty high mortality of dolphins because they didn't, have, they didn't know how to work their nets. And so when, when I'd have to, you know, monitor the, the kill, how many were you know, female, female, da da. And then uh, the second boat, they were very good. I think they had out of, uh, oh, you know, 40 tons of fish they caught, they probably lost you know, three dolphins, which was really remarkable. But the interesting thing is that uh, this was all during the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, for some reason, the dolphins followed the tuna only in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Hmm. And, no one knows why. They thought it was some kind of symbiosis, some, you know, symbiotic relationship between you know, sharks and killer whales and things, but they never really did. I don't think they really know for sure. But because of all the government regulations, U.S. government regulations, all the tuna boats would go on to, they'd go down to Costa Rica or Mexico to get their flag. So we lost our entire industry because we were regulating them so highly, even though we had, you know, um, treaties. But then come to find out they they're, they're, they're catching tuna on, in the, Western Pacific, and in the Western Pacific, the dolphins do not follow the tuna, so they, they were they were free to you know catch them there. So that, that evolved over about 15, 20 years. So now there's no there's no tuna industry in, in California or the U.S. to speak of. Hmm. Um, and so you know how to scuba dive. It's in your bio. It said, and how did you? So where have you been scuba diving? Well, uh, I learned at a learned in Lake Huron in Michigan when it was really cold. <laughs> and then I came to California and I learned it was really cold in the Pacific too. But I've been to Hawaii, um, Mexico, um, Belize with Sid, <laughs> um, the Keys, 
uh, many times in Monterey. That was my kind of my home thing. I went to I went to school at Moss Landing Marine Lab, so we did a lot of scuba diving there. Uh, so that basically that's it. I'm trying to think of another place I would have. Yeah, that was probably it. So, um, as far as characters, how do you get into their heads? Because you've got wildly diverse characters in in the crow's nest. Uh, well, I try to give them, you know, I, I, I try to do a little list of all the characteristics I want them to have. And I, and I get, a, you know, I get a lot of the characteristics and uh, the behaviors from, you know, just people watching like at the airport and stuff and, you know, making up <laughs> stories about people as they walk by and, uh, and then trying to, you know, superimpose that onto these characters. And, and I think it's just, again, it's imagination and, uh, you know, thinking about how, how you would react in a situation like that and then how you would not want to react in a situation and then, you know, put that, impose that on the, on the characters and then try to put them in situations where they just almost impossible to get out of. Right. And like I read your book, the sky or sky dance, your first book that was published and that's a action pack too. I know you really enjoy Clive Kessler and who are some of your other authors that you enjoy reading well, that influenced you? Oh, you know, I mean, the very first, I think when I was 12, now maybe 12, 13, when I, I saw my first James Bond movie, From Rush With Love, and I left the theater and got on, went to the bus stop at the Woolworths, and I went inside waiting. And I, the only books I used to read in those days was How to Throw a Football, How to Catch a Baseball. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I saw this whole rack of Ian Fleming. So that summer... Must have been 12 or 13. I wrote all Ian Fleming's at that point in time. So he was the first one. And then, then it was, uh, I can't remember where John D. McDonald came in, somewhere in there, but then Michael Crichton because of science. I just loved all his work. And then Daniel Silva now is one of my favorites. But, you know, I'm kind of like, I, I'm not only an in-genre reader, but I've become actually an in-club reader with Jim and Claire and everyone in our group. I'm nice plug. Yeah, right. So... Yeah, those are the ones influencing me. Terry. I think we have um, a question or two, Sarah. Yeah, and I had some questions too. I'm kind of along what you're talking about who you who your influences are, and it sounds like you had time in certain types of jobs where there's a lot of downtime, so you have reading. You know, you had to entertain yourself with reading a lot of times too, but. Um, when when did you decide that you could write something? Uh, well, you know, I, I think on the tuna boat, I, I started writing paragraphs, you know, just descriptive things. And but then I put that aside for about, well, I, I kind of was one of those people that thought, you know, you, to be a writer, you had to be suffering and live in a garret in Paris. And, you know, you had to have this terrible life and kind of had a great life. You know, but then I started. <laughs> Some of my favorite authors, you know, like Crichton, and he was an MD, and uh, uh, Vince Flynn of Insurance Age. I mean, all these people, they, you know, they had normal lives. They just had, they just used their imagination and uh, enjoyed writing. And so I started doing it, and it just, it was fun. And that, of course, the class, you know, that we had with Michelle, that was very, uh, I just really enjoyed that. It just showed me technique and, and art. So, and, well, yeah, and science. <laughs> So once you retired, you kind of focused on it then or kind of decided you could do it or did you? Well, I was, I, I was doing it probably five or six years before I retired. Okay. Okay. And uh, it just, uh, I thought I'd have much more time in retirement to write, but <laughs> such is not the case. We keep you busy. Huh? <laughs> uh, pours a vacuum. <laughs> well, traveling to all those baseball stadiums takes a lot of time. Yeah, but that, yeah, that's been put on hold over COVID. So, yeah, one more to go. Well, two more to go, but that, that'll be it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, and Jennifer asked, because um, that, so you have two two books out now, and they're both standalones, correct? Yes. So, no, do you have, like, a favorite character that you would consider doing more with from either of those books? I think, I think Carlos uh, in the sky dance, I kind of like to get him with uh, Johnny in some way, shape, or form someday mm. from those, both those books. <laughs> do a crossover? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to do it yet, but that those would like to get together. Yeah. 
No, and this, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, I love that when you have, you've created an entire world. And so, you know, bringing different characters together would be really fun. Yeah, it would be. And they're two outlaws. So they make it, that makes it a lot more fun. So. Yeah. <laughs> more Renegades, happy. I should say. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Skydance, so that was when you were working in the oil fields in Ecuador. So did you ever experience anything um, risky or that you, any anecdotes you want to share about that? Well, I think the, um, it, was, it was an experience because if you haven't been down in the Amazon, in, in, you know, in, the, in the rainforest, um, it's, it's stifling, you know, and trying to work down there. And I was... I didn't, I don't, I, my Spanish is very limited. And I was with this crew and we were having to walk like 10 miles on these, you know, hacking these trails up through the foothills there in the, in the, in the mountain or in the foothills. And uh, I probably lost 25 pounds that, that trip because I could never keep up with the water. You know, it was just, it was grueling, you know, and these guys were just carrying my pack and three other packs and just running up the hills. I'm going, oh man. I'm not adapted to this climate, but no, it was really interesting. Saw a lot of lot of wildlife there, a lot of birds, a lot of, a lot of snakes, a lot of uh, venomous snakes, a lot of venomous you know tree tree frogs. Uh, but it was uh, I was never in any danger, but it was it was very isolating because you were out in the middle of nowhere. But we I mean we came in by helicopter and then the helicopter left, so then you were wow. You're on your wow. Own. And so. I loved how you started that novel with the bird, you know flying and then you ended it with that cool bird so that was yeah. nice my osprey yeah yeah nice technique mm -hmm. well the sky dance is the exercise the male and female hawks do and you know when they're doing their mating thing so that's where that came from nice now have you been in a submarine before yeah the one at the museum of natural history <laughs> Because they are terrifying. And so when, like, explain about these little, like, they, they make these submarines, these drug. Yeah. Yeah. They're all made, yeah. I mean, they could literally, I mean, they make, cartels make so much money. They could afford a conventional <laughs> submarine. But the problem is you need 30 people to man it. And then, you know, then you got to get rid of it because these are disposable. As soon as they, as soon as they drop the load, they get rid of it because they can't take it back. It's, they're just disposable. Uh -huh. So there, and you know, we don't know how many make it through. Maybe only 10% of them make it through. The rest of them drown in the ocean. We just have no idea. They don't really, they aren't putting statistics out on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they're, uh, they're flimsy at best. And a lot of them are called semi-submersible. So they're just barely, you know, on the surface. Others are full submersibles. And uh, they're usually made out of fiberglass or materials that, you know, deflect well, that do not that absorb uh, sonar, so they're invisible, and they try they paint them so that they're you know from from aerial from satellites and stuff that they're almost invisible to see. But uh, a lot of money goes into them, but they they have a big return on investment. Sarah, we have a couple more questions. Yeah, do you want me to read them? I, um, yeah. So Claire asks um, about your characters. You said that you have lists of characteristics you want. Do you have their whole personalities mapped out before you start writing or do they evolve as you're writing the book? They, uh, they evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And the, it's kind of uh, situational too. So I put them in situations and how would they react in this? In this? Yeah. Do you have an outline when you do it or are you just going from scene to scene to scene? Yeah. I'm a pantser. Pants in it. Pants in yeah, it. <laughs> I'm a pantser. Yeah. I like to write myself into a, into a corner and then try to get out. <laughs> I'm finding that's more and more difficult and I'm kind of evolving into a, let's see, what would I be? <laughs> what do we call it? A planter or something like yeah, that? Or the... I'm halfway between them now. So I do kind of like, I, I do outlines, but they're kind of like on post-it notes. So they're not really. You know, we, who are we talking? I think we were at uh, Killer Nashville. We were talking about this one writer who does a uh, their outline is like forty five pages or fifty pages, and all they do is just fill in he said, she said, and they've got a novel. And I'm thinking, That's pretty detailed stuff. You know? <laughs> but I'm not. Yeah. Sure. So you know, do you have? So what was the first? 
was there a scene or a character you said it was it was the submarines is that what kind of started you with this particular book yeah and i think uh it was, it was a submarine that uh, was, I saw that and I thought, boy, how miserable would that be? You know, <laughs> who am I going to have run that? So it's got to be someone who's got experience at sea. So I made, I made Johnny, uh, you know, his, his, his backstory is that he was a very successful, uh, he was a very small kid, you know, he was picked on when he was from New Orleans or from Louisiana. And the only thing he ever had success was, was on his uncle's uh, shrimper, shrimp boat. And he learned how to be an engineer, he learned how to be a skipper, and he became very, very successful in the, in the shrimping industry. So much so he had a lot of disposable income, which went right up his nose. And he got, then he got in tight with the, or he got in hock with the cartel, and they made him, because he had so much knowledge of the sea, to kind of manage this program and sail these things. And so that's how Johnny got involved in it. And then once the, once the cartel had their claws in him, he was kind of, Helpless. Mm-hmm. Rick, do any of your characters um, take after you at all? Only the heroes. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, not, not, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I don't, I don't see myself. I always see other people in the, in the roles, you know? Yeah, I don't, not too much. Maybe some, maybe some, maybe there's a little bit of chase. But there's Chase is probably five or six people that I know. Let me read this comment from Donna. Um, She says, I loved this book. It was very exciting and I couldn't put it down over a period of two days, about 16 hours. I liked his use of El Cuervo, Crow, Raven as the drug lord's moniker became a metaphor for the title. So I, yeah, so that was the drug. So did you, when did that come to you? Well, um, I'm trying to think. When, well, the crow's nest. Was, I, I like that idea right from the beginning because on the tuna boat they have this, they call it the stick, and it's a crow's nest. And the the fishing captain is up there, and he can see for like five miles around. He's got these huge binoculars, and that's called the crow's nest. So they, they're up there. So then the crows just kind of kind of weave their way through the story of ravens, and uh, and cuervo is Spanish for crow or raven. So it was so that became the you know, antagonist. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a bird. There's, there's some birding themes in Uh your, uh, (laughs) yeah, there was, it was a lot heavier. You know, I got into some of the, uh, marine, marine birds and stuff, but then it got, you know, someone said, you know, that's just, that's that's skimmable stuff. So take it out. (laughs) It's just a little too heavy, but I'd love to throw it in there, you know, well, and your last book too started, Karen was saying started and ended with birds, right? Like, Yeah. So one of the things about the ospreys, they they come from the jack pine forests of Michigan and fly down and over winter in in Ecuador, you know, and then they back to Michigan, you know, in some way. California. So I've got Sid and Randy are are fact checking me on that right now, I know. (laughs) And Harriet has a question. Yes. Um, she says, Do you have a favorite favorite scene or part of the book? Um, I like the point where uh, Johnny and Chase have hijacked the submarine with the 10 tons of cocaine and they're outrunning the, uh, the cartel. And then he's che- he, Johnny's teaching Chase how to drive the boat and all of a sudden one of the cables sprung, springs and uh, they, start, they start going into a dive. And Chase is just panicking, you know, doesn't know what to do. Da, 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 da. And Johnny's just cool as a cucumber and just, you know, gets some vice grips, connects it together and, you know. <laughs> the MacGyvering of it. <laughs> Chase, yeah, he's just, you know, he's a, he's a MacGyver, right? And Chase is just, you know, sweating, sweating bullets trying to get out of the situation. But that was kind of one of my favorites, that. Let's see, I have another comment. It says, the Johnny character was a good foil for the protagonist, the more innocent Chase. And you kind of answered this, but who inspired this character? So you said they weren't you, but was there any, you said they were a mix of people. Were there any particular people that you had in mind? Uh, Johnny was based on a, a fellow that was on one of the tuna boats. Uh, he was actually from Costa Rica, but he was kind of like that, uh, kind of mischievous, but you know, <laughs> could fix anything intelligent, but uh, 
wouldn't let on, you know, how smart he really was type. And, and there was a couple, yeah. So that was based on that guy. Like, and Carlos in the first book was based on a, a, a friend of mine and I met in Ecuador on one of our trips, another biologist who was you know, kind of resourceful like that. So yeah, I, I, there are based on, you know, definite character, definite people. What about, were, oh, go ahead. What about female characters? How do you get into their heads? Who helps you with that? <laughs> what you did. <laughs> <laughs> it helps to have a critique group and being the only guy in it. <laughs> because they were in a per different perspective. They said, nah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> To keep you in check. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I was thinking, I had a question about you were saying you were on the, the boats and there was a lot of time to kill and no VCRs or, you know, phones or anything. And did you ever hear good stories on those trips where people, did people tell stories? Yeah, but nothing I can talk about here. <laughs> <laughs> Are they in the books? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a pretty, it can be a pretty, um, it can be a pretty raunchy group out there. <laughs> that is true. If you, see no. these, if you see these tuna fishermen, you know, when they're, when they're out there, they're just like, you know, they've got fish guts all over them and oil, and they try to wash their clothes like once a week, and they just, they just, but they put their work clothes on. And then when they go to the beach, they open their lockers, and they have like, they're bejeweled. They got these beautiful clothes. When they walk up, you have no idea what they, how they, because they make, they actually make very, very good money at the time they do. And they're just, it's a totally different life when they get on the beach, you know. And how much was like the time on, time off the boats? Like, well, for me, for them, you know, they, they're probably out there probably six and well, probably nine months out of the year. Wow. And I was, I was on two trips before I got another, another job. And uh, I was out 60 days on the first one, and I think about 90 days on the second one. And uh, and that's it's and you're uh, we never went to port. You know you're you're out there 2,000 miles off the coast. You know you're you're out there. So what do you eat that whole time? Well, that's interesting because you know they really have it, it, they have a big competition for the for the for the cook. You know, that's the thing you get, you know, in fact, on the second boat, the cook was a part owner and we just had these incredible meals <laughs> and um, lettuce is good for like 30 days. Okay. Fresh lettuce. And what they do is they take a, take a head of lettuce and they wrap it in a newspaper, soak it, and then put it in the, in the refrigerator. And then you know, by the third days, you're peeling off a lot of brown leaves, but there's some but after about after about a month, it's a lot of three bean salad type things out of the can and stuff. But the meats and the fish were just to die for. I mean, they could we pull up a mahi mahi or we call it yellowfin and have the steaks right then and there. It was just unbelievable cooking. And then for my birthday, the one chef said, "What do you want?" I said, "I like baked Alaska." So we made baked Alaska for. Him. <laughs> I mean, with the meringue and the whole oh. nine yards. It was like you can make anything. And we used to love the thing I loved most was they always had a a. a uh, what do they call them? They were like an assi a assistant chef. You know, they're just uh, the galley boy, I guess they call them. And they were like, they only had a quarter share. They didn't make half or a quarter of the money that anyone else made. But when we saw the galley boy in there cleaning the uh, the grease out of the fryer at night, we knew the next morning we'd have fresh donuts. <laughs> <laughs> But after I was go, not expecting to hear that the food was good. So that, oh, that was a surprising answer. <laughs> you know, I watched some, I watched some of those shows on the, you know, the fishermen up in Alaska and stuff and what they eat. And that's, 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 that's nothing like these, these guys are living, you know, living in luxury, right? not luxury but <laughs> great food. Good so food. Was, uh, yeah. I, I gained weight. <laughs> mm. You want me to read some more of these, Karen? Yeah. Um, yeah. Jim says, um, your books are rich in detail, technical specs and operational processes. How long does it take you to research and write a book? Probably two years. And like we've always, like I always say, I'm not a writer, I'm a rewriter. <laughs> and um, chapters um, and characters um, come out of nowhere and become all of a sudden become central to the story as time goes on. And uh, 
Yeah, so it, it takes about two years. And do you go back in then and really do the research after you kind of pants it through the first part or do you? Yeah, it, it, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. I try to get it out as much as I can and then um, then put you know, more of the technical details. And I thought it was really, it's really kind of funny. My, my oldest son, Casey, um, when he was like 12, he started reading like Hunt for Red October by Clancy. And I, I love Clancy because I love the technical stuff. You know, because it was so involved, you know. And I asked Casey, I says, well, do you understand all that technical stuff? No, nah, no, nah, I just read right through that. Get the <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a lot of people like that, you know. So I, I want to have a balance where they like to read some of it, you know, because I think you can learn from a book. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. But you don't want to just, you know, it doesn't have to be so heavy. So I'm trying to do that balance if I can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does anybody else have any book? I have one question in here from Donna, but I want, is there any other specific questions about this book? Feel free to unmute and speak up if you have a question or a comment. No. All right. You answered them all. Well, what about, let's, can you tell us about the the last question here is, can you tell us about your next books coming out? What is, what's happening? I know there's some good, exciting news. Well, I just talked to the publisher today and he said, are you done with that last go around? I said, I (laughs) thought I sent that like two weeks ago. (laughs) So he's ready to go. He said anytime now. So that should be this is a completely different. Yeah, it's this. It's 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 the first of a three book series so far, and it's about, oh, a, great. It's about a San Francisco detective that seems to get involved in these international <laughs> incidents that he had no idea getting into it. It just evolves, but uh, yeah. So, and well, you have the cover. I do, and th- I what the first thing I said to the publisher is, "Hey, I got this really good connection. One of the best <laughs> artists, co- cover artists, you ever said." It was me, Karen Phillips. You know, and she uh, sent a web- website as well. We have our own in house. But, uh, but anyway, oh darn! This was the cover he did. Very cool. Do you oh, have a cool? Do you have a release date? No, no, that'll probably be in the next week or so. I'll find something out. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, you'll have Very to keep eye us- catching. Yeah. yeah. Very eye catching. Yeah, it's pretty mm-hmm. pretty bright. A lot of red. But, Do you have your elevator pitch ready for that one? Uh, I'm working on it. I've got, <laughs> I've got the elevator pitch I had in the uh, you know the query letter, so I'm going to be using that for the for the time being. But you know those things evolve. And Jim was telling me I have to get one of those uh, do speed dating next time at uh, Voucher Con. He says then will you you learn your pitch really fast. I like that. <laughs> well, give us the um, not so short version since you haven't come up with it yet. Oh well, it's. Um, Let's see, what is that one? Because I'm, I'm working on another one that's get, got me confused, but it's, uh, uh, I don't even have it before, man. I have to take a, I think about that. Well, what is the, so the title, how do you pronounce that? Uh, that is, that is uh, Maskarovka, and it's the Russian uh, art of deception. Oh. And the premise is uh, how the Russians are influencing our elections, but not in the ways that we think they are. Mm. And for the reasons we think, and it actually boils down. I wish it would have come out two years ago because the premise <laughs> is that there, uh, there's this Russian oligarch that is funding U.S. foundations to suppress, um, you know, to get laws passed to suppress our export of natural gas to Europe, so that they can dominate Eastern European and Ukraine. Uh, oh yeah, you're. <laughs> Well, God, if they could have just had this two years ago, you know, so it may be passe by the time it comes out. But Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> no, people will be interested. Yeah. And as and Donna wanted to know, are you still with Moonshine Cove Publishing? Uh, well, I not not for this one. Uh, oh, okay. Next, this will be uh, Blue Water Publishers out of, uh, out of Florida. And I do have a question about your, we didn't even talk about your silver felt chat. So how did that um, come about and how was... How was that again? The so your award, la, your um, oh. silver. So I always want to say it, silver falchion. I always want to say silver falchion. falchion. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I I have not a clue. I thought, well, you know, um, there must have only been two, or maybe only one contestant for the, the action adventure. No, no, no. <laughs> no I mean, how not. did you find out about Killer National? Was that your publisher or was that just other writers? Or? Um, I think actually um, 
maybe it was Michelle Dreyer told me about her. Someone in, in, you know, in capital crimes we've been talking about. Maybe it was Jim along, you know, several years ago. But I, I first went in, in 2017, I think. And Carol, my wife and I went there and God, we just loved it. Just had a great time. And it's just it's a fun place to be, you know. And it was such a great, I learned, you know, new tranche of friends every time I go there and just learn much every time. And then so the next then COVID, in, in, you know, got in got in the way, and then the next year I, I submitted the crow's nest, and uh, you know, just because it was published by then, so and then I just got real lucky. But I'll tell you, um, I was I was a deer in the headlights when I when he announced my name because it's the very first award because it starts with A, and I had nothing prepared, you know. I just so I was a, and then so this year, flash forward a year a year later. And I'm sitting with, with uh, Harriet and Donna. And I told Donna, like, you know, four or maybe the day before, I said, look at, she says, oh, I have no chance of winning. There's no way I'm going to win this. I said, I don't care. <laughs> have something prepared. You know, maybe I would say something, you know. That's and she said, oh, right. it'll never happen. It'll never happen. So we're sitting there all of a sudden. Donna. <laughs> That's right. We have some serious representation in this and Zoom Jim, room right Jim now. Won. Yeah, Jim, wow. <laughs> yeah, that was just incredible. For the last two years, we have we have three uh, three winners in the last three years, and you know, a lot of uh, and then you know, of course, so uh, Anne's book was up for it too. So I mean, we had we had pretty good representation. So yeah, I was really pleased. I mean, I I was thrilled, but I just I wasn't ready for it. Yeah, at yeah, all. that's exciting. No. Yeah, Donna, congratulations. We'd love to hear from you, too. <laughs> and Jim, too. Thank you very much. I was thrilled. And Rick, it's true. Uh, Rick kept saying, you better prepare a speech. No, if I do it, it'll jinx it. <laughs> but fortunately, I'm a former high school teacher, and we always have something to say, no matter <laughs> what it is. So I just kind of talked, you know, talked off the top of my head, and I have no idea of what I said. It was <laughs> the stupidest. It was good thing in the world. But, uh, you know, uh, I was just uh, uh, blown away. You know, like Rick. I mean, no. you never think it's going to happen. You know. No, you anyway, guys are. It was fun. We had a great time at uh, Tiller, Nashville, didn't we? Just a great yeah. time. It's just a, yeah. A did a lot of sightseeing and, you know, Rick uh, show, chauffeured Harriet and me all over the place. So nice. It was so nice. I <laughs> Miss Daisies. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. And Jim, too. Jim's still here somewhere. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we got a speech. Yeah. No, I had no idea that was coming. Um, no, this was one of the categories that didn't announce any, uh, any nominees for. It was just, you know, my name got blurted out there and I think I was more surprised than anybody else. <laughs> wow. So you didn't even know you were on a list. Well, I was on a list for another category, but okay. not, not this one. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Very cool. You guys are going to have to teach a seminar, how to write award-winning books yeah. from Capital Crimes. Yeah. Crime. Was, yeah. yeah. That was for the black label. That wasn't even for his newest. That wasn't for his dead drive. Right, that's for that's, yeah, black label. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Because it was the in the past year. Is it is it for 20 like or yeah, did you come out too late? Did Dead Drop come out too late for that one? Yeah, Dead Drop Dead yeah. Drop will be uh, in the running for next year. Okay. Okay. But I think Donna's advice is correct. Don't prepare a speech because <laughs> then you will win. <laughs> yeah. like all win you didn't so yeah win and look like a yeah look yeah. like a deer in the headlights or not win and and have spent all the time preparing right yeah i'll take the embarrassment again yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah as That's marie said fun. congratulations yes congratulations yeah. to all of you guys now that is awesome and so yeah so you've got so you don't know but hopefully soon we will post the um the date for your next book hopefully you'll have a you think you'll have a publication date coming soon i think so yeah i just okay. um, you know this is uh, for those writers out there that one of the one of the uh panels we had and, and i was a, just oblivious to this but they said you know one of the important things when you're editing your book is to you know read it you know read it aloud i read it obviously read it read it aloud so you hear it 
And then Terry and the panel, he was on, said, well, there's a couple of programs that, you know, that read it back to you. And one is read aloud in uh, Word. And there's also one in, uh, for Acrobat, you know. And I'm, I'm telling you, I, I came back here and on my new book, this, uh, not, not Mascarothka, but uh, Double Cross the Bridge, and I started listening to it. And I, it's been through like 15 beta readers, da 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 da. And I, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm picking up probably 15 to 20 errors just by listening mm. to it. You just, you just hear it better than you see it, you know. So yeah. and my advice is if you get a chance to, so what, what I'm doing with this Mascarova, my last shot is I'm going to go through the media, read, read aloud and see, and then I'll send it out because that way I try to get as many mistakes captured as I can. But. Good. Well, your books are pretty lengthy. How many uh, words is this one? Uh, um, I think it's uh, seven. Uh, it's probably 78,000. Oh, okay. Um, not too bad. The, the double cross the bridge is 81,000. I just figured that out. But yeah. So yeah. Right. And I just posted the link to Crow's Nest, the Crow's Nest in Amazon, in case anybody hasn't read it already and would like to. There's the easy link to it. So um and I'm sure through that you can find your first book too. And yeah, so you've already got the second one underway for this. This will be your first series then. Um, yeah. And are you contracted for three? No, no. This is a, no. Yeah. Just okay. Three, so, yeah. Okay. Exciting. All I right. Want to, I want to thank everybody for showing up. To, this is the world's longest book launch in history. It started <laughs> pre-COVID and I got interrupted. <laughs> <sighs> It's a slow motion launch is what it is. <laughs> slow, slow roll. I'm going to milk this for all it's lit for as long as I can. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're the only one. I think there's a lot of catching up right yeah. now happening. Lori but, Ham uh, says she thinks it's the new norm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no, and I just want to remind everybody that um, – this Saturday, we have our members meeting. I'm sure you're all aware of that, but we have the uh, members marketplace. Rick will have his, um, that's for this book too, right? You'll have your um, video, your trailer. Yeah, your video. Yeah. So every, we've got, I think we have six authors who are doing videos um, about their books and then they'll be there to answer questions and talk about it all. So that's going to be really excited because we got Terry Shepard, hopefully, if he's filling up to it, um, hosting and um yeah, I think those are a great way to get the word out too. And it'll be really fun to see what everybody comes up with. I think actually, Donna, I think you're on that one too, right? Um, I think that's, yeah, I haven't been too on that, but. Um, I'll be showing uh, um, my uh, a book trailer for um, uh, one of my uh, Athena books. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, it was made by my uh, grandson, um, uh, Jacob, who's, who's uh, a computer uh, wizard, an absolutely <laughs> brilliant kid, and he did a great job. So I'm going to show it with pride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's yeah. making me a, a book trailer for Saving La Familia also. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Nice to have those young people connections. <laughs> Yeah, plenty of those things are, you know, being able to put together a, you know, two minute or one minute or two minute trailer. Boy, that's yes. Yeah, uh, and they're a expensive, lot. you know, to have done. So it's nice to have a a grandson who um, <laughs> feed money to legitimately, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, you're paying for it. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I gotta get the twins on that, Rick. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had we had Thelma and Louise over the weekend, so <laughs> how old are they now? Three? Four. Four? Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Pretty soon they'll be making videos before you know it. <laughs> yeah. Well actually, you know, my my our oldest grandson, he's six, and he just got into the uh at his his elementary school, they have a video uh production program you know they have, their wow. own television, they have their own television station so he's the, he's the first grade representative on it he's doing videos and they're teaching him how to use the you know use the cameras and how to edit them and and doing it in, in first grade that's wow crazy you know i'm just so it's pretty oh unbelievable gosh. and he's oh. teaching how to code already too I'm like, wow 
So that is yeah, incredible. Be doing mine. <laughs> I, I, yeah, put them all to work, put the grandkids yeah. to work. Oh my goodness. Well, you guys have any last comments or anything you want to say, Rick? Um, no, again, thanks very much everyone for, for showing up and, you know, it's available. If you haven't bought it, it's available on uh, Barnes and Noble and Amazon or call me. I'll get, I'll get a copy to you one way or the other. So 